Today we're going to look at a nice functional equation and this one comes from the 2021 USA Junior Math Olympiad and I'd like to point out that my solution is adapted from something on the art of problem solving thread related to this problem. Okay, so let's see what our goal is. We'd like to find all functions from natural numbers to natural numbers such that if x and y are natural numbers, the following two equations are satisfied. So f of x squared plus y squared is f of x times f of y, and then f of x squared equals f of x squared, where here notice the square is inside of the function and here it is outside of the function. Okay, so in order to get started, we're gonna do some exploration. And what I mean by that is we'll calculate f, evaluate it at certain maybe simple numbers and get an idea of what the function might be. Okay, so let's start with one. So let's notice that f of one, well that's the same thing as f of one squared because one is equal to one squared, but that's the same thing as f of one all squared. So notice f of one satisfies the equation x squared equals x, but there's only a single natural number that satisfies that equation, and that's the natural number one. So what that tells us is that f of one is simply equal to one. Okay, so now let's see if we can calculate f of two. And we can, and that's because two is the same thing as one plus one, but likewise, that's just one squared plus one squared. But now using this equation right here, that'll be the same thing as f of one times f of one, which is simply one times one, so that means f of two is also equal to one. So maybe if we were brave, we would already think that perhaps the only function is the function that takes uh, every natural number to one. In other words, the constant function one, but I think maybe we should gather some more data. So I think f of three is a bit trickier and we're gonna need some tools in order to calculate f of three. Let's maybe first notice that f of four is the same thing as f of well, two squared because four is two squared, but that's gonna be f of two all squared, but that'll be one squared, which is equal to one. So let's notice that f of four is also equal to one. And then we can also show that f of five is equal to one. So notice f of five is the same thing as f of two squared plus one squared because five is equal to four plus one, but that's gonna be f of two times f of one, which is one times one, which is equal to one. So let's notice that we have f evaluated at five is equal to one. But notice that f of five being equal to one will very, very quickly tell us that f evaluated at 25 is also equal to one, maybe using this formula right here. And in fact, now we've got enough information to calculate f of three. So notice one is the same thing as f of 25. But now 25 can be rewritten as, let's see, three squared plus four squared. Because 25 is part of the three, four, five Pythagorean triple. Oh, but that's gonna be the same thing as f of three times f of four. But we already showed that f of four was equal to one, so this whole thing is just equal to f of three. But now reading from the left to the right, we see that f of three is also equal to one. So notice we're getting one for maybe all of the values that we've tried so far. So I think maybe the motivation here is that our only solution should be the function that takes everything to one. Also, this last little example that we worked through gives us some motivation that maybe we should pay particular attention to Pythagorean triples and that'll actually form the basis of our solution. But after we go through our solution, I've got an idea for another solution, but I didn't work it out all the way. So I'll maybe sketch out a start for that and you can finish it if you'd like. Now we're ready to launch into our solution. And in order to do that, we're gonna build maybe a new relation or a new functional equation out of these. And then inspired by this observation we had on the previous board that it seems to be important to look at Pythagorean triples. Okay. 
So let's notice the following. So if a squared plus b squared equals c squared, in other words, a, b, and c are Pythagorean triples, then we have f evaluated at c all squared is the same thing as f of c squared just by this, let's see, second functional equation. But then that'll be f of a squared plus b squared, which is f of a times f of b. So that gives us some sort of like nice simplification if we're in the realm of these Pythagorean triples. But that's not where we're gonna stop. Now we're gonna use the well-known parameterization of Pythagorean triples. And that says if a squared plus b squared equals c squared, then we can, like I said, parameterize these as follows. So a equals x squared minus y squared, b is equal to 2xy, and then c is equal to x squared plus y squared. And this is true for natural numbers x and y satisfying, well, the following rule. We know that x is bigger than y. We need x to be bigger than y because we want a to be a natural number here. So like I said, this is the so-called well-known parameterization of Pythagorean triples. There are some more rules that you can put in here to make it a so-called primitive Pythagorean triple, but we're not gonna worry, that here, worry about that here. So now we're gonna run this kind of equation right here with these values of A, B, and C. Okay, so let's do it. Okay, so we'll start over here with f of c all squared, but that's gonna be f of x squared plus y squared, given you know the parameterization of c that we have. But let's notice that we can use our first equation over here to write this as f of x times f of y all squared. So that's where we're getting something new here off of this parameterization. Okay, so now let's push it in the other direction. So this will be equal to f of x squared plus y squared all squared by our second functional equation. But then this is like playing the role of c squared, which is equal to a squared plus b squared. So we can write that as f of, let's see, x squared minus y squared all squared plus 2xy quantity squared. But now we can use our first functional equation again to split that up. And that'll split that up into f of, let's see, x squared minus y squared times f of 2xy. And now this in fact will be the useful functional equation towards maybe proving our main result that this function must be the function that's identically equal to one. Okay, so now let's go towards that. So just to reiterate where we are, we showed that f of x squared minus y squared times f of two xy was equal to f of x times f of y all squared. And that was for all natural numbers x and y, where x was bigger than y. And this will be the functional equation that'll take us home. Now we're gonna finish this thing off by induction, actually strong induction. And I won't worry about the base case because we did a bunch of base cases during our exploration phase. Okay, so what will the strong induction hypothesis be? So let's suppose for all k that are between one and n, maybe including one but not including n, we have f of k equals one. And so if that's our strong induction hypothesis, then what we want to show is that f of n is equal to one. So we're assuming our statement is true up to the natural number n, and then we'll show that it's true for the natural number n. So classic maybe inductive argument. And now we're gonna break this down into cases. So case number one will be the case when n is even. So let's do that. So n is even. But if n is even, then that means that n is equal to 2m, where m is a natural number. So that's just the kind of definition of an even number. Oh, but let's notice that based off of this, we know that m is somewhere between one and n. 
it can include one, but it will not include n. And actually, if we wanted to, we could make a much more restrictive inequality, but we won't really need to do that for our purposes. But let's notice that since m is on this range here, by the induction hypothesis, we know f evaluated at m is equal to one. So if we can somehow get f evaluated at m into, well, probably this functional equation, because this will be the most useful functional equation, then we're good to go. So how can we do that? Well, if we want f of m to appear right here, the easiest way to do it is to set x equal to m. So let's do that. So like I said, we're gonna set x equal to m in our functional equation, and then we just have to decide what we should set y equal to. Well, if we want to have a two times m inside of this functional equation, well, the only place two times something is appearing is right here. And in order to get a two times m, if x is equal to m, we'll need y to be equal to one. So that motivates that choice. So now let's see what that gives us for our functional equation. So we'll have f of, well, this will be m squared minus one, that goes right there, times f of two times m, that'll be this term, equals f of m times f of one all squared. But let's notice by our previous calculation, we know that f of one is equal to one, by our induction hypothesis, we know that f of m is equal to one, so that means both of these terms are one, so their product is one. But if we square it, we obviously get one. Okay, so there we have that. But now let's look at this. We've got a product of natural numbers. We know both of these are natural numbers. That's because the codomain or the range of our function is natural numbers, if you will. The range isn't the right word here, but it's often used. But the only way to multiply two natural numbers and get one is for both of them to be equal to one. So that means that f of m squared minus one is one, and we know f of two m is equal to one. Now, of course, we don't really need this f of m squared minus one equal to one. That doesn't really help us, but this does help us. This is exactly what we need because 2m is equal to n, so we know that f of n is equal to one. Oh, but that's what we wanted to show to finish the induction. But that doesn't totally finish the induction. That only finishes the induction when n is even. So that means we've got one more case to look at, and that is the case when n is odd. So we just got done showing we're good to go if n is even, and now we're gonna jump to the case when n is odd. Okay, but let's notice if n is odd, then what can we do? Well, we can write n as 2m plus one, where m is a natural number. You might say, well, that only is the odd numbers three, five, seven. It misses the odd number one because we don't include the case when m is equal to zero. But that being said, we have a base case, which was during our exploration, that covers that case when n is equal to one, so we don't really need to worry about that. But let's notice that if m and n are related like this, then in fact we know that m is between one and n, but not including n. But then by our induction hypothesis, that tells us that f of m is equal to one. But now what we'd like to do is use this fact, this fact over here that f of m is equal to one to somehow prove that f of n is equal to one, where m and n, like I said before, are related by this equation. And now we'd like to find, and now we'd like to somehow choose x and y so that 2m plus one is one of these terms, either x squared minus y squared, two times x times y, well, that's impossible because that's even, and here this is odd, or x or y. So I think choosing 2m plus one, one equal to x or y won't really work. So what we'll do is choose x and y so that x squared minus y squared is equal to 2m plus one. And, well, I mean, this isn't so hard. Here's what we'll do. So we'll choose x, equal to m plus one, and then y equal to m. 
And let's notice that we'll have x squared minus y squared. Well, that'll be m plus 1 squared minus m squared. That'll be exactly 2m plus 1. And so that's actually really good news because that'll get a 2m plus 1 into this equation. Okay, so now let's plug these values of x and y up here. So we'll have f of, well, like we said, x squared minus y squared is 2m plus 1 times f of 2 times x times y. So let's write that down. So that'll be f of 2 times m times m plus 1. That's 2xy. So that'll be equal to what? Well, f of m times f of m plus 1 quantity squared. Well, we know that f of m is equal to 1. What about f of m plus 1? Well, in fact, that's also equal to 1 because if n and m are related by these two, maybe one inequality and one equation, we know that m plus 1 is also less than n. I think that's pretty clear. I don't think we really need to do anything to check that. But then that'll mean that f of m plus 1 is also equal to 1 by the induction hypothesis. So we've got 1 times 1 quantity squared, but that's just equal to 1. But now what do we have? We've got a natural number times a natural number is equal to 1. That means both of these natural numbers must be equal to 1 themselves. In other words, f of 2m plus 1 is equal to 1, but 2m plus 1 was n, so we have f of n is equal to 1. So there we have it. That completes the inductive step. If n is even, then f of n is 1, and if n is odd, then f of n is also 1. So we've done it. We have proven that this function is identically equal to 1. In other words, it's the constant function 1. So now I'm going to leave you with the start of what I see as a potential different solution and maybe post in the comments if you get anywhere with it. Okay, so here's what I think is potentially another path, but it involves this fact which is maybe not well known to people taking a junior math Olympiad. So n, which is a natural number, can be written as a sum of squares where these terms are not quite natural numbers, but they're non-negative integers. If and only if every prime of the form 4k plus 3 in the factorization of n occurs with an even exponent. So let's notice if n is equal to a squared plus b squared, so in other words, it can be written as a sum of squares, then f of n can be written as f of a times f of b, but f of a and f of b would both be equal to one by a induction hypothesis that we've made earlier in the solution. That means that the whole thing is equal to one. So that means we need to look at the case when n cannot be written as a sum of squares. Then I think probably the trick is to somehow choose an m which is less than n and look at f of n squared plus m squared and somehow express this number n squared plus m squared as a different sum of squares where each of these parts is less than n. But that'll give us a product which is equal to 1 because both parts are equal to 1 by, again, an induction hypothesis. But that means f of n times f of m is equal to 1, but then f of m is equal to 1 by an induction hypothesis again. So in other words, f of n will be equal to 1 finishing this proof. But I think this is the trick right here. The trick is like if we build a sum of squares out of something that cannot be written as a sum of squares, and I'm maybe like abusing notation here. This is a different, you know, x and y. That shouldn't have been the a and b. Then we can re-express this as a sum of squares which with correct sizes. Okay, so I don't know if this goes anywhere, but if you'd like to try it and see if you get anywhere, maybe post that in the comments. And that's a good place to stop.